All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Alliance of Angels workshop on how startups create enterprise value and returns. We are privileged to have Dave Parker join us today. Dave is a best-selling author and leader in our startup community, so we really appreciate his time. Uh, before we go in, just a bit of logistics. Uh, we want to keep this interactive session, right? So if you have any questions for Dave along the way, please don't be shy. Feel free to jump in, right? Uh, this is a standard Zoom meeting, so anyone can, can speak up. So uh, feel free to do that. If you were, if you were rather text in something through the chat window, that'll be fine too, but this tends to work best if you are uh, willing to jump in and have a, have a conversation, right? And, but however, on the flip side of that, if you are not speaking, <laughs> we, we do ask that you keep yourself on mute, right? So uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you, are, you have your kids are adorable, you have a really cute dog, etc. but they don't have to be part of our session today. So let's just have a quiet environment so everyone can have a great learning session together. So, and before we start, I'm going to share a few words about Alliance of Angels. This, this is the organization I run, and my name is E. Jane, right? Uh, this is an uh, uh, angel group here in the Pacific Northwest. We have 140 angels in the organization. Every year, we put about $10 million into 20 companies. Most companies that are fundraising from us, they're looking for a total of between half a mil and 1.5, and our typical check size is 250 to 500. Right. And if folks uh, invest, right, so to be very clear, we're not a fund, right, we're a group of people. So uh, when folks invest, it, it go directly onto your cap table. Usually it's four to six people, each person putting in 25, 50 or 100. And the sum total that is 250 to 500. Right. Sector-wise, we're about a half IT, about a quarter consumer. The rest is life sciences, hardware, energy, etc. But that's it. Now, we are a sector agnostic investor. We're also stage agnostic. Right? This is never too early to, to hit us up. So uh, our main heart filter, however, is that we focus on the Pacific Northwest. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're interested in, see if you're fundraising, you're interested in uh, approaching my organization, feel free to send me a note. My email is below. Right? Or if you're an angel investor and you're interested in learning more about how you could participate in my community. Feel free to send me a note as well. All right, so with that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand the session over to our guest today, Dave. Hey, Jen, thanks very much, I appreciate it. I'm gonna hit share screen here, make sure everybody can see my screen, okay. Yeah, all good? Looking great. Awesome, well, thanks everybody for joining. I'm gonna share some, uh, some excerpts and resources today. Um, and a little bit about me and the, the big topic today is really driving enterprise value. So if you're a founder thinking about how you value your company, especially be between the early stage and late stages, we'll talk about that. If you're an investor, I want to give you some context around how to think about your investment thesis relative to what types of companies. And it's really going to be driven by data. So one of the things that I'm kind of a nerd about at this point um, from the book perspective is looking at uh, data where, th where the data is available so that we can really look at that as a driver for valuation and, and outcomes. So I'll give you a little bit about me, the big market valuation drivers, um, which every, almost all investors have at least in their head, some of them actually score them. And we'll talk about individual company valuation drivers. How do you create, deliver and capture value? I'll walk you through the 14 revenues and the data from the, um, the 14 revenue models. And the encouragement there is if you're a founder, really it's just about picking a primary and a secondary and walk you through those. And then some final wrap up with some public market comps around how companies actually get valued when you sell, which impact both when you start as well as when you sell. So that's kind of the agenda for today. So first about me, uh, uh, so raised 12, exited 85. So no unicorns, mostly singles. Um, sold three of those five, closed two of them. So you learn more from your failures than your successes, sadly. Um, and then was the senior VP of, of programs at Up Global, which is Startup Weekend and Startup America, and uh, was COO there. So uh, author recently, and thanks, Eugene, for the shout out on Trajectory Startup, just went live on uh, last Tuesday was the publication date. And uh, it was fun to hit 44 on the, on the list of bestsellers for this category, right? a super niche category of a new business. Um, but it was fun to, to get ahead of Brad Feld, at least in, in a couple of the books, because Brad wrote the foreword to the book as well. So I'd call twice a uh, venture capitalist. I'm a random angel um, and done about 13 transactions total. And now with NextPath and Mark Upson with NextPath Advisors, helping companies, founders exit their companies at the end. So kind of how I split my time. 
So resources here, I will share the excerpt with you in the notes. Um, so you can get the free excerpt from the book, which breaks down the 14 revenue models, as well as the unit economic information. And the slides will be available after uh, the program from AOA. All right, first let's talk about the big revenue drivers and big market drivers as it relates to your investment thesis. Um, and again, these ones are kind of company agnostic where we're gonna get very specific to the company, how the company can actually do things to drive revenue value. But these are the, the big ones um, as a market driver. And, and when I was at the last fund I was at and I've ran a family office for three years as well, we would look at these as kind of our, our big, like the, the things we wanna say yes to before we really look at detail or at the company. So first off, big and, and new and nascent markets. So um, if you have a big, big market uh, and your timing's particularly good, um, it's kind of like riding a big wave, right? Versus a small, small wave. And the thesis there is that from a, a market perspective, generally speaking, markets win. Um, team comes next. You know, it's probably closer to a 1A and a 1B, which is why I didn't number these. So do you have the right team for the right product? Or the, is it a balanced team? Do they have the right skill sets? Uh, but the sentiment here is, is, or sentiment I should say there, is that a great team in a bad market is still going to produce a meh result where a mediocre team in an awesome market could be a blockbuster, right? So just know that market and team are kind of a 1A and 1B. Product is next, stickiness, does it solve a problem or is it just fun? So if it's B to C and you're building games, if it's not a fun game, then the answer is it won't sell. But you really have to focus on the pivot around the problem first and the solution second. So think about it from that perspective, of, does the product really solve a problem? Uh, timing, ultimately timing is not in your control. Bill Gross did a great video on, on a TED talk about timing. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, it's the best seven minutes on the internet for startups. But I think timing is one of those things we only know in retrospect, right? We can look backwards and go, bye, our timing on that investment was awesome. But at the time we put the money in, we kind of look at it as headwinds and tailwinds. Um, competition, big factor here if you're a founder, has your competition already sucked the oxygen out of the room by raising, you know, multiple companies raising over $100 million, you're probably going to be in a tough market to raise capital because it's already been overfunded. Traction, early indication of proof and it's the flywheel spinning. So if you're still pre-revenue or, or some of your pre-product, um, if, but if you're pre-revenue, you don't really have traction yet, right? So getting some data will be helpful. Unit economics is the next one. So which is revenue model sales marketing. We're gonna kind of dive deep into that data set today. And ultimately is it efficient or not efficient capital? Think Tesla versus Snap. So Tesla, when the first investors put money in, it took them a long time to get that money out. And there was lots of additional dilution that came in because it is not a capital efficient business to build electronic or any cars for that matter. So those are the big market drivers. And I know that if you're an investor, you have those in your head and sometimes you have them on a checklist. Um, I would encourage you to think about providing feedback to those founders around, here's where I didn't like the pitch because of these things. But those are the big drivers. Let's get around what the drivers are then for what are good for companies. A couple other things first, stage matters. So one of the things that's important to understand here is that early stage startups, for, as look at, as you think about revenue drivers and, and, and revenue models and unit economics will look way different at the early stage than they look at scale. Uh, at scale, they have revenues and they have customers and they may have multiple revenue models, but at launch, you typically have one you're focused on. So just know the stage of the company is different. Also contextually know that if you're B2B or B2C, you have a different um, set of unit economics and a different set of uh, lifetime values associated with that. Um, and if your products or services, or if you're a blend of both. So know that all of those things will categorize your company slightly differently if you're a B2C product company or B2C service company versus a B2B product company. So some things to think about as you categorize your product and solution. And finally, just kind of two views before we get into some of the details. Um, there's the founder view. We tend to think very product out and then unit economics second, and then, oh, what's the valuation at the end and what's the return? But investors tend to think about it as returns first and then work your way to unit economics and ultimately say, is it a cool product? So just now we're looking at the, the two sides of the coin very differently, right? And the investors are looking, how do I get money out of it? And from a founder perspective, it's easy for an investor to get a check into your company, but it's very hard for them to get a check out of your company. So know that that's part of the thing that um, investors need to get answered as you're out pitching your company. So there's some context about valuations. All right, so let's break down um, the business model breakdown into its components. 
Um, the first thing is there's, think of this as a Venn, there's three components of the business model and I just wanna make it less black box-ish and more metrics driven. So you create value through your product or service, you deliver value through how you sell and monetize it, and then you capture value or that's the outcome that is the result of you know, top line revenue and net margin. So let's break them down in a little bit of detail. So first creating value, the top chart is your product or your service or a blend of the two. It's your cost to build it relative to how big is the team, how many people are required, how many engineers, how many uh, person months to build it. So, but it also includes hosting or it could include manufacturing and it also includes the cost of delivery or support. So there's a difference between customer success, cost of sale and a cost of support or um, technical support on the back end. So those are all of your costs associated with creating value. That's all about the product. So now the next question then becomes is how do you sell it? What's your cost of selling? So your components in delivering value are your revenue model, which will break down the 14, your pricing, how you price it relative to market and what the value-based pricing is versus cost-based pricing, and um, your customer acquisition cost or CAC. So what it costs to market to, create leads, how many people does it require somebody to sell it or not sell it? Um, and then know that your um, lifetime value then becomes part of that calculus as well. And one quick note here is I don't want you, I want you to distinguish the difference between promotions are not pricing or revenue models. So for example, a freemium is a promotion. A time-based trial is a promotion, right? But it, that by itself is not a revenue model. It's actually just, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a promotion. So know that that's part of it as well. So capturing value is what's left over. Uh, ultimately, the question then becomes how much uh, revenue do I drive and what's my net profit relative to, sorry, my keyboard just said it needed to get plugged in. I hate it when that happens. So uh, my gross margins and my net profit. So ultimately you control these things by controlling the cost to build it and the cost to deliver it. That's where your controls are. This is just an outcome. So you, can, you don't have much controls over those things. You have to control them at the first two. All right. So those are your th the three pictures of the van. If the van is out of sequence and your, your ultimate capturing value is low or people won't pay for it, then you have a different problem. Is it a product problem or your price is wrong? So if you follow the CB Insights data, uh, the number one reason startup fail is they build a product that nobody wants and nobody wants is defined by two things. It's not useful or fun and nobody's willing to pay for it. So those two things make up that, um, that piece of it. All right. So product market fit, this is a product market fit is this elusive things. It's like unicorns. It's actually not product market fit. It's just math. Um, so I'm going to give you the math for product market fit. So the definition of PMF um, is really being in a good market with a product that satisfies the need of that market or the demand of that market. So think of it as the no more pivot stage. So we have a product market fit when we're like, we have a product and we don't have to pivot it anymore. Pre-product market fit kind of looks like this from a math perspective. My leads are increasing. My closing ratios are increasing. My time to close is decreasing. My referrals are increasing. You kind of get the point. This is all about the math that we can look at early with a CEO of the company before they have a, probably a VP of marketing or VP of sales and look at like, what's the math? And the outcome of this early pre-PMF stuff is, is the equivalent of like um, compound interest. Right? If you're trending in this direction, if lead volume is going up and time to close is going down and average contract value is going up, woohoo, like it's going to be an exciting time to invest. If they don't have any of the data yet, you're going to use a different method to value the company and you're going to go back to, does it have a big market and do I like the team or not? But as they start to have data, you're going to evaluate the company based on data. No data, you're basing it on the total addressable market and the, and the team. So know that product market fit ultimately isn't a mystery. It's not a unicorn. It's just math. And these are some of the components of the math. All right. So how do you monetize? Let me go through this, the 14 revenue models in the background of how I got here. And by the way, I'm totally open to a 15th model. If you come up with one, I have just found over the last six plus years of watching this data that there are 14 in tech. Um, there's other outside of tech, but within tech, there's 14. So here's a quick... Um, Note though that don't use this to, as the, I have a calculus way to calculate my valuation if I'm a pre-revenue startup. The answer is revenue models is one impact um, of your valuation, but it's a heuristic. Um, it's not a calculus. So just know that that's part of the process. 
All right. So the data, this came up as a, a process um, probably almost seven years ago now. I was running the Founder Institute here in Seattle. I had just gone to work for Startup Weekend. Um, somebody came to me and said, hey, can I have your financial model? And I was like, well, that's, yes, you can have it because I'm a community guy and I'm happy to give it to you, but you're going to break it. And frankly, it's a little different. So mine was a business to business subscription business. And theirs was a business to consumer marketplace. So it raised the question of like, how many templates would you need to cover 80% of the market? So every time somebody asked for a template, they, I could hand him a template and say, use this one. So innocently enough at the time, with no idea that I was going to start a quest, I reached out to the CEO of, of Crunchbase and said, hey, can you pull a list for me of every mm, seed funded company over the last 18 months? So then it took longer than I thought to get to all the answers. But what we did was we tracked those 2,654 companies over a longitudinal study of six years. Never planned on that. That's just kind of the way it worked out. Um, so the surprises in there were the number of seed rounds. Seed rounds went from seed one to seed 10. And part of the, the reason for that was they had to, seed rounds got broken into milestone driven rounds versus straight valuation driven rounds. So, um, and then we were looking at, um, I'll, I'll show you the combinations next. The other thing we looked at was what the, the results of the failures were. And we went back to the Wayback Machine and looked at all the companies who were no longer in business and hadn't been acquired. And the aha there was that 80% of them on the, the Wayback Machine is the Internet Archive had the cached pages of their last pages before they went out of business or closed. And consistently, 80, 85% of those companies had no call to action. They had no pricing page and they had no um, clear way for the customer to buy. So think of it as the pages that said, call us for more information, call us for price. So my analysis there was the aha of looking at all those pages was the equivalent of if Ejen was my boss and said, hey, go find us a product that does X. And I found four products and yours was one of them, but I had to call you for price. The answer is you didn't make the short list of people I present to my boss. And uh, I'm sure there's other reasons they went out of business as well, but very consistently around the trend, that was one of the surprises. So we then took that data, ran it through Mathematica. Uh, I worked for a hedge fund family office for a while and, and uh, it was great to have access to the tools and the analysts. You'll notice a couple of ahas here. One was combination models. This is the, the metric here on the bottom is from seed round to A round funding in days. And the, uh, on the, this one is from A round to B round funding in days. What you'll see here is a combination models. So service plus subscription as an example, got funded super fast from seed to A, um, but about normal from A to B because they were showing early revenue from services revenue is most likely the case. You'll also note here that gaming companies matured about the same rate in funding as others, but their time from A round to B round was super fast um, because they had consumer-based driven demand and they had some data is my guess. So, but you'll see this is the way the general models broke down and their timing to funding. So let me walk you through the models. So I'm gonna walk you through these kind of quick. I'll give you a summary of the 14 at the end and I'll give you examples as we go. But since this is an investor centric pitch or uh, presentation more so than founders, I'm less concerned about you picking the right model for your startup, but you'll get a list at the end and you can do that too. So first one is fee for service. Originally I thought it was not gonna be there because it's not scalable revenue and investors don't like it. But the fact is, is services revenue is still legit revenue. And you'll see it in um, companies that are, especially in combination models of companies. So Accenture is a great example. Um, Stride is a publicly traded company that is in the education space. Um, this model works in both B2B and B2C. Of course, it's, it's based on bill rates and pay rates. So if I build Dave out at $100 an hour to a client, I pay Dave um, $50 an hour, I have a 50% gross margin. So just know it's not scalable because as you add more customers, you have to add more people. Uh, that's a bit of a challenge in scaling the business and it's good from a, a bootstrapping perspective. It's tough from a scaling perspective. Second one is product as a service. This is a derivative from the customer's perspective. Instead of buying hours from Perkins Coie or whoever my law firm is at Wilson Sonsini, um, I'm buying an outcome. So I'm buying a SKU and there's people and technology in the background that are delivering that SKU. And again, this is one that uh, Southwest Airlines is an example. IBM these days is a little bit more than that example because most of their revenue comes from services, but they have a product service mix. And you'll find that in, in companies in that nature. Guide and Financial is a company in Bellevue that I'm on the board of, and uh, we, that's our business. We sell a skewed product. There's people and technology in the back end. The customer doesn't care about the people or the tech. They just want to buy the outcome. 
works both B2B and B2C. Moz is a great example. When they were SEO Moz, they built tools and provided services. Then they sold the services business and just went in the tools business. So sometimes it's hard to make that split because the revenue is pretty addictive. Commerce is third. So example here is Wayfair and Lululemon on different ends of the scale. Wayfair sells other people's products on commerce. Amazon, by the way, was this at launch, but today they're a combination. Really, they're a conglomerate market today. Lululemon sells their own brand. So this one works both B2B and B2C. Your key metrics here, your wholesale cost of goods sold, your average margin, and a number of um, the average basket, and a number of baskets per month. That's your key metric. So it could be physical goods or virtual goods. Fourth is subscriptions. Um, subscriptions are super popular. Subscriptions everywhere these days. Uh, Salesforce is a subscription. Spotify is a subscription. You can buy a subscription to LaCroix Water on Amazon if you'd like. So subscriptions have become pretty much the standard and there's a reason for it. It's based on the multiple of revenue that companies get at exit. So just know there's a cause for that subscription migration. Uh, it's, it's about predictable and forecastable revenue. Your key metrics on subscription are what's my average revenue per user or ARPU. It could be average contract value, ACV as well. My conversion ratio from um, users who are trial or users who are um, free to paid, depending on B2B or B2C. And typically within this, you're gonna see tiered pricing within the subscription model, or you should see tiered pricing relatively quickly to address different ideal customer profiles within the subscription, okay? So that's subscription number four, super popular. Number five was the only new one that actually came on during the six year time frame was uh, the metered service model. So think Twilio, AWS, UiPath, and Plaid Tech are all examples of metered service. So this is the API economy and the emerging API economy. The, the multiples on these ones are really, really fascinating. And I'll walk you through the public comp multiples here in a minute. Key metrics here, similar to subscription. A lot of these start at subscription and then do metered services up. It's B2B only. I'll give you the B2C example would be your T-Mobile or Verizon bill, typically viewed as a negative from a consumer perspective, but as a business perspective, typically viewed as a positive. If my AWS bill went up, it means my customers are using more of it. Usually means I made more money. So again, looks a lot like a, a subscription valued completely different than a subscription. All right, that's number five. Number six, transaction fee or rental. Your examples here are Stripe and Chegg. Um, though the transaction fee and the rental model are different, uh, uh, different models, they, they, the mechanics are very much the same. So it works B2B and B2C. In the case of Chegg, they're renting a, an academic or college level book and turning that a certain number of times. So in this one, it's your average transaction revenue, the fee or percentage of that transaction in your fee or, or commission and the number of transactions per month. So Stripe is a great example there too. Stripe does not book the top line revenue of your sale. They're only booking the transaction fee of your sale. So that's the transaction fee or rental business. Marketplaces are next. Think uh, eBay, Alibaba, and Uber. These are all marketplaces. Uber obviously does other things as well, but it, it launched as a marketplace. So your key metrics here, your average transaction amount, the number of transactions per month, and your commission percentage per transaction. Marketplaces typically book top line revenue versus transaction fees only book the fee. So just know that there's some little nuance there and there's two sides in a marketplace. So you're gonna to have to track your marketing on the seller side and then the buyer side. Cause if you mix, mix those two economics together you're gonna to kind of have a mess. So that's number seven marketplaces. Number eight is combinations. So as I mentioned, uh, great example, Smartsheet, publicly traded. Most of you know them if you're here in the Northwest. 25% um, of their revenue comes from professional services and the market doesn't hammer them on that revenue because that professional services shortens their sales cycle so that they can sell more subscription revenue. So that's an example of combination. Another trend we see right now in marketplaces is a transaction fee plus a subscription. So uh, subscription premium customers get a different fee structure. So they're adding that model of transaction fee plus subscription. So know that that's combinations are just taking the previous seven models and how do you combine them together? So typical of this previous seven. All right, we uh, start to get in a little more obscure ones here going and I'll just go relatively quick through them because it, it matters, um, you see these ones less frequently. So gaming is an example. So King, if you have um, followed Z2, uh, Z2 sold to King for a big number. When you make virtual swords and the margins are amazing. So just know that that's definitely the case. This is B2C only. Uh, key metrics here are downloads, percentage of people who play, and the average in-app purchase and the number of in-app purchases per month. There's your key metrics for that. And 21-day usage pattern matters a lot. Advertising and search is an example of one. Clearly, it works. Facebook and Google are good examples, but it only works at scale. 
So know that if you're a startup and you want to do advertising and search, the key question is how do you get to a million unique users per month and how much will it cost you to do that so that you can monetize it with advertising or search? So let's say a CPM rate of $35, which would be a highly competitive CPM rate today on a cost per thousand basis. And I wanted to monetize my blog. My blog gets between 3,000 and 5,000 users a month at $35. That's $100 to $150 a month. So it's not worth monetizing around advertising or search unless you have the users. So then the question is, how do you get the users and how much is your cost of customer acquisition? So that's advertising and search. New media is when somebody says, we're going to go viral. That's, they mean new media. So Clubhouse is an example of going viral. Snapchat's an example of going viral. Again, this one is B2C only because it's all about the consumer. And for every consumer you pay to acquire, you acquire more than two unique additional consumers um, that actually not just register, but register and actually refer somebody else. So I've worked on one of those in my 20 plus years and it was classmates.com and we were 2.02 on the K factor, which was, you know, unicorns and butterflies and, and pixie dust. It was amazing. So pretty rare and it only works B2C. So, but if somebody says, if you have a B2B example of going viral, let me know. I will definitely write a check for that one. Uh, LinkedIn did it for a very short period of time where they introduced the tool to load all of your contacts. Uh, so they spiked and then went back down to less than one. Big data is the next one. The, this one again, only works at scale. So Splunk, patients like me are great examples of this one. Um, it's really where I can, I have to have the data to monetize the data. Um, Splunk kind of crosses the line between both big data and metered service, but a little bit more on the big data side. So they price it accordingly. But if you don't have big data, you have to take the time to acquire big data like you would do for search or um, uh, yeah, search and advertise. 13 is lead generation. If you remember Mint, they have a new uh, equivalent competitor today called Chime. Uh, when the product is free, I always tell people you're the product. So Chime is a great example. They get paid a lead referral fee from credit card companies to refer you to them. So they're the new version of Mint. Uh, All-Star Directories locally was one of those examples too. Again, this is, this is B2C in the sense that I'm selling consumer data, but the life insurance companies may be the ones who actually do the work or, or buy the leads. Sorry, landscaping guy showed up. All right, so that's lead generation. 14 is licensing. If you remember back to Microsoft 15 years ago, there was lots of concern around like, uh, can we switch from licensing to subscription? Lots of hand wringing. And in retrospect, the answer was kind of a duh, obvious. Um, but licensing still works today and it's the 14th model. So if you're licensing and a revenue on a, for a geography or particular field of use, you'll still see this as, as one of those. So here's a quick summary. If you're a startup founder, I would encourage you to pick your primary model and your secondary model. Know that that's kind of where we're starting with um, your, your revenue models. All right, so here's where we get geeky with the data then give you some relative data points. So what I did then was I took these revenue models and went back to the public comps equivalent and did an analysis of um, assuming you're gonna exit to a, a public company and not go public, which is where the majority of companies will exit. The question is, is, is your revenue accretive and what's your revenue worth? So we went back down and broke through the, the concept of enterprise value and the enterprise value is the price or the market cap divided by sales trailing 12 months to give you a, a, a forecastable revenue number relative to benchmarks. Obviously I can't do EBITDA because most early stage startups don't have any um, profit. So it, it doesn't really matter. And then a quick note here, combination revenues are a little bit more like a conglomerate. So it's hard to separate AWS's revenue from Amazon's revenue total. Uh, and the current strike stock prices you'll see in, in the data really reflect the uh, current market conditions. So we'll just kind of monitor them and see how they go. So that's the uh, public comp data. Let me swap screens here real quick. All right. So I'll give you the, the, the data and then I'll give you this, the summary data as well. So, so what, what we took here was I took, for example, Facebook, the, the ticker, the, the average of the, the last trailing 12 months on a quarter by quarter basis of their pricing history. And you'll see here that it created ranges. So Google was 6.67, Facebook was 9.2, Splunk was 11.4. Um, and basically broken them all down into here's transaction fee businesses, here's subscription businesses, and here's productized as service businesses. Um, and by the way, if, if you want to help contribute to this data set at some point, you're definitely welcome to reach out to me because I'd like 
more brains looking at it to say, how early can we push this data down to the startup phase? Because it clearly affects when we're out marketing a company to sell, this data has a dramatic impact on what their exit valuation is. So, th so that's the original data set. So I'm trying to get that up to uh, 400 ish companies. And obviously today we're, we're at, you know, less than 50. So the summary then becomes this. So services businesses trade at 0.75 to 1.75, 1.5x valuations, not a big surprise. Um, if we had a million dollar company that was predominantly services, it would sell for a million dollars. <laughs> so not a surprise with that one. Um, productize the services businesses, think IBM's business today, one to two X revenues. So it's a good way to bootstrap a business if you can't raise funding, but it's not gonna give you great exit valuation. Um, commerce businesses have a fairly wide range. The Lululemon, if you're selling your own brand is eight X. So a niche commerce business was building its own brand eight X, but a product selling somebody else's more like four, 4.4. 4. Amazon actually was combined revenue between mostly commerce marketplace and then AWS is 4.4 X on revenue. Um, meter service then Twilio AWS 24 times. UiPath is going public here soon. Uh, UiPath fits in that one as well. So definitely one that I would tell you the trend to look for as you're investing is how do you look for metered services companies that can go from subscription to metered services and can track it. Um, most of our companies happen in the subscription business. Um, eight to 12 X revenue is pretty standard. The gates there, I would tell you, are if you're super niche business, you're going to be at the low end of that. And if you're, um, if you have a big target um, ad total addressable market, you're going to be at the high end of that. So a million dollar business there could sell for eight to 12 million, could push up a little bit higher if there's still a big runway and room to run. Um, marketplaces, four to eight times revenue, combinations, wide range there, again, eight to 12. Um, new media. So I would categorize media here as new media trending towards old media. So new media being Snap and Clubhouse, old media being um, companies like Mashable who just went um, public and split their stock into a cloud company and a media company. And then lead generation, Chime is a good example, four to five X. And finally, licensing is somewhere between five and nine X. So the, the revenue there, not a big surprise based on the public comp data. So let me hit stop share on that. I'll go back to the slides. So um, this will be in the slide deck for you. But again, if you want to, uh, if you, you want to contribute to the data set, I'm happy to happy to discuss because there's definitely more thinking around it than one person can do. So those are your public company comps. So some quick notes on that as it relates to you all. So a few, few additional sell side notes. So if you're at the end of the process, this isn't going to impact you early in the process. So park this if you're a founder, don't over index on this on your pitch deck. It has nothing to do with your pitch deck. <laughs> it has to do with how we sell your company at the end. So rule of 40 matters. Are you growing more than 40% a year or do you have a mix of between 40% or 20% profit and 20% growth? So rule of 40 is going to matter. So is there a logical and acquisitive upmarket buyer? So um, it, versus going public, like if you're the biggest player in, in a super niche space, the answer is mm, maybe hard to get acquired because people don't necessarily get what you do. Uh, is your capital to revenue model under three to one? So ideally, if you've got a million dollars in capital raised and you're doing a million dollars in revenue, it's pretty easy to find a buyer. If you've taken $4 million in capital and you've only got to a million dollars in revenue, it's going to be kind of hard, right? But both because of the preference stack and the lack of traction. Uh, or lack of capital efficiency. And then can we create competition between buyers that ultimately will positive, positively impact your valuation? So know that that's, that's part of the process. Again, this is the end of the deck. This doesn't go into your pitch deck if you're a founder. This is just what influences the outcome when you sell. And then last slide, a couple notes. Um, so keep in mind, Dave did not say, this is the way I calculate my enterprise value of my company if I'm a startup based on zero revenue. That's not the case. Um, this is, there's too many variables early on. If you want to calculate an early enterprise value, you can use Dave Berkus's. The Berkus method has got a 20 year track record. Um, Dave actually wrote a, a blurb for the back of my book, which was awesome because I feel like I've been internet stalking him forever. Uh, and then uh, picking up potential buyers based on your track record. Um, so look at um, what the size and the stage and the technology is. One of the things we think about a lot at the end of the, the process is how do we do business development as a process to find you a potential buyer based on the right partnerships and right product fit. 
And then this data, as I mentioned, is still a work in progress. So you'll get um, a copy of the PDF from the slide presentation today. But um, if you want access to the data, let, let me know. I'm happy to, to, uh, to do that from an open source perspective. And then ultimately, um, in startups, you need to be creative. So marketing matters a ton, and it's a super creative process. Um, but marketing is not a revenue model. So, and what I found in watching this data set for the last few years is revenue, new revenue models are super rare. Like new marketing strategies happen all the time, but just separate out in your in business model components. You got to create value, deliver value, and ultimately capture value. So with that, I will open it up to questions. I see there's a few notes as we go. So I'll, I'll answer this or, or just come off mute and ask. All right, where do consumer products business model fit, i.e. beverage, muffins, marijuana, edibles? That's a great question. Um, so you're, it's gonna fit it closer to the commerce model and the hybrid commerce model of like Lululemon. So it's gonna be manufacturing costs. So in the, in the original data set, some of the ones I looked at in the unicorn list were folks like SpaceX and Tesla, right? But if you're thinking of consumer products, it's really gonna be the cost of manufacturing goes into your cost of goods sold and does it scale in a predictable way. And then still you're back to average margin. I still have a cost of sale associated with it, but it's gonna be, my cost of sale is gonna be more controlled versus a wholesale cost of goods. So think of it that way from a manu manufacturing perspective. These definitely are focused on tech, right? Predominantly on tech. Um, <laughs> so are too many buyers a problem? I don't know that too many buyers can ever be a problem when it looks at, you have to, you have to think about it though as a process. If you're gonna, at the, again, end of, end of your startup life cycle, you go to sell the company. Um, you have to run a process to get as many buyers at the table as fast as you can once you have that first buyer leaning in. So know that that's the, that's the part of the process that helps you get the competition price up. Having a single buyer, however, will definitely, we, we see a difference between you know, 30 and 50% valuation at the end by not having competition versus creating competition. All right, um, other questions? I know I blew through that, but I'm sending you the docs. So I'll make it worthwhile, so. Hey, Dave, could you recap the uh, rule of 40 again for me? Yeah, so the rule of 40 is, are you growing at greater than 40% a year or a combination of 40%, 20% growth and 20% profits? So in the early stages, you could be growing 150% a year, but your number may be too low to actually um, be interesting from an acquisitive perspective. Like if you're doing less than a million dollars in revenue, like big companies aren't gonna care very much. So, and when you're starting off a basis of super low numbers, it's easy to double or do 200, 300% a year. So in that case, we're gonna look at monthly growth, but if the business has gone flat, right? And you're not growing at greater than 40% a year, then it's gonna negatively impact the valuation. But if you're growing at 40% a month, it, it probably means you're coming off a base of a super small number. Thank you. Great question, Joanna. Uh, on one of the earlier slides, transaction, I think you mentioned not starting your price too low. Uh, so yeah, actually it was in market, I think marketplace. I can go back to it. Um, so the, the big thing here is that you can't start your pricing and your margins too low. So in, in the case of a transaction fee business, I want it to be above 15% um, versus, if you remember, um, Upwork before it was Upwork was Odesk and their margins were like 12%, right? And when they brought on a new CEO after merging the two companies, they had to get the margins up to 20%. So because you still have a cost of customer acquisition in a transaction fee or marketplace business, in the marketplace business, you have two costs, right? You have the cost of acquiring the sellers and a cost of acquiring the buyers. And I have to track those two things differently. So I would rather see you if you're a new startup, keep your price high and create a promotion for the first year that discounts it, but it sets a pricing expectation going into year two that your price is going to be back up. So that's what I mean by don't start the pricing too low. Um, Red, great question. Um, the only thing I've seen on the data around the product market fit math is what I just published in the book because I was so frustrated by it. Because it's always one of those like, well, product market fit, like when you go, if you're a founder, you're gonna go see a VC. And they're gonna be like, that's awesome. Let me know when you have traction, come back and see me again, 
and you'll say, well, what would you like to see for traction? They'll go, I don't know. It's kind of like pornography. You'll know it when you see it. That's BS, right? It's because they don't know either, by the way. I'm not, I'm not digging on the, the investors. I think you know, an investor doesn't want to say no because if you're right, they want a chance to invest. At the same time, it's a lot of work to do the product market fit math. So if you can sit down with a founder early on and say like, here's your key metrics that I would measure. And part of what I've tried to do with the revenue models and the excerpt that you can download is I've identified some key metrics you can use for each of those 14 revenue models. You may find your one unique key metrics. I've had this argument with a few VCs. You're like, every business has its own unique key metric. Like maybe, but in the meantime, these ones are prescriptive. Like you can use them and they will be a good place to start. I hope that's helpful, Red. Uh, Corey, is there a standard margin investors look for an e-commerce model? It, if, so my guess is probably, it depends on the size of the transaction. So if it's, if it's B2B or you're selling bonds, you can do basis points, but any business that runs on basis points makes me super anxious. Like my first startup was in the software licensing business and our average transaction was like $12,000. So in that case, I can be in margin points that are less than 10%, but you don't want to be. If your average uh, revenue per transaction is $25, you're gonna to need to be in a 30% range. So again, it's a, it's a slider and these are heuristics. Um, there's also some heuristics around LTV to CAC ratios. So for example, if you're B2B because your price point is high, my LTV to CAC ratio should be greater than five. If I'm B2C, my LTV to CAC ratio should be greater than 10. So, and what I mean by that is if my lifetime value of the customer calculated at 12 months is $1,000, and I'm a consumer product, I might be able to spend $100 to go get that customer, but I can't spend $1,000 or $2,000, right? Because I'll go negative. And I can't calculate my LTV at 24 months or 36 months just because I want to. I, can, I have to start at 12, and then as I have real data, I can increase that value. All right, uh, so Social Benefit Corp. Um, standard methods of evaluating. So the SBC question is really interesting because it has more to do with what you're committing the SBC to do in advance. So are you committing to give a percentage of revenues away, a percentage of profit away? Are you committing to doing good things? And then the revenue model is really separate than the structure, right? So know that you have to, you, the key here is with an, S, an SBC is you have to disclose to your investors that we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna, Tom's Shoes was one of the first examples. It was a buy one, give one. As long as your margins are high enough, you can totally do that but you have to disclose it to your investors before you take their money. You can't change it after you take their money, right? I was a for purpose, I was a for profit. Now I'm a for purpose, but you already put money in. You can't change it. So just know that I'd separate those two things out. You still need a revenue model, right? When I look back to early social investing, the answer was, well, you don't really need a revenue model if you're doing it for social purposes. Mm, now you still do because you need to get to self, you know, break even and self-funding. Otherwise you're a nonprofit. So uh, thinking about starting a company with the end in mind, what are your cautions? Would you give around over architecting a company for one acquirer? Yeah, I, so I don't think you can, it's a great question, Patrick. So I, you can't really optimize around exits at the early stage. You have to optimize around the problem, right? And then you can pivot the product around the problem and you really have to focus on that. Salesforce, for example, or seldom buys a company less than 10 million in revenue. So in that case, you're gonna spend seven years trying to optimize for Salesforce, you'll forget about Salesforce in about you know three months. So know that you, I think having in mind what revenue model will produce the best result in advance is super useful. Like we could, Patrick and I could start a services business and do consulting and build a billion dollar business and it will sell for a million dollars. Or we could create a subscription business, right? That will sell for more than $10 million. That would seems like a good place to start. But optimizing around exit, I'd say, don't spend too much time doing that early on. Uh, let's see, Michelle's question for marketplaces is 30% commission considered too low. Again, same sliders as commerce. It really depends on what your average transaction fee is. If you're, it's, if it's a $10,000 um, marketplace commission or transaction, then 30% is going to be ridiculously high because you sell bulldozers and uh, commercial equipment. If you're selling, um, you know, uh, Etsy type shirts and dresses, the answer might be, it, maybe it's okay. But it really comes down to this is think of it this way from a founder perspective, and I guess this works for investors as well. If if you if the back of the napkin math doesn't work, the complex math won't work either, right? So you have to have a thesis on your basic math, and this one just says pick one of the fourteen, test it out. If it doesn't work for you, 
right? Like I want to be recurring revenue, but I'm really a transaction fee business. That's what you are, right? Unless you can create a product. So in guidance case, one of the things we've been working on is creating a technology platform that our customers can subscribe to as well. And if you look at the multiples on uh, revenue from those companies who are doing the same, it's tough to break out of service multiples and find a product multiple revenue. All right, uh, John, I really appreciate uh, clear definition of creating enterprise value, creating a business that addresses senior citizens and their families. I've been cautioned that companies like AARP could easily copy. Oh, I love the copy question. Um, all right, so Clayton Christensen's book, um, The Innovator's Dilemma is a brilliant book for you. So one of the, so Clayton passed away last year, he used to be at Harvard Business School, ran the entrepreneurship school there. His point around um, innovators dilemma is that big companies have two things you don't have as a startup. They have revenue and they have customers. You have something they don't have, which is you have innovators because all the innovators have left the big companies. So it's always a concern, could Microsoft come along? Could Google come along? Could AARP come along? And the answer is most of the time they won't, right? Because they're not in the business of innovating, they're in the business of buying companies. So in the case of, um, Microsoft, they're going after multi-billion dollar companies today when they bought Nuance. But when Nuance started, what, 15 years ago, voice technology was a super small market. It was new and nascent, very much like Airbnb or very much like um, Uber. It just took a lot longer to mature, right? Because getting your, the voice stack into a Toyota center console took a long time. So when it launched, it was a new and nascent market, but it had to become a multi-billion dollar market before Microsoft really cares about it. So depending on what you're launching regarding the AARP question, if it's not already a multi-billion dollar market, it may not matter. Uh, let's see, a couple other questions here. Repeat the author's name of the innovator's dilemma. Yes, or I can Google it for you, Clayton Christensen. So uh, brilliant author, very consistent, uh, Christensen. Um, okay, uh, George asks here, are there any rules of thumb for establishing a pre-revenue, very early revenue value of a startup? Oh, great question. So in the Berkus method that I gave you a highlight to, so Dave Berkus, early angel investor based in Los Angeles, kind of one of the first early super angels. He gives you a method for evaluating the business based on a number of factors, team, market size, et cetera. And it's really a heuristic based on pre for pre-revenue companies. So just keep in mind, early stage, if you're going to go up and to the right, really based on the total addressable market, um, the product, right? So the first few of the list I gave you in the big valuation drivers. and But the more you have data, the more it's going to be based on the actual data, conversion metrics, ratios, and growth. Because you're going from risk capital, early stage, what AOA does, to growth capital, later stage, private equity. And as you go up that stack or that, um, that funding stack, if you will, you have different sets of requirements. So look at Dave Berkus's the Berkus method as a way to do that, B-E-R-K-U-S. Um, and it's a link in the doc that I, um, that I sent over as well. So uh, yeah, terrific, great question there. Um, and, the, and again, keep in mind, your goal there as an early stage founder, if you're pre-revenue is really around what I would call being on the pitch. So think of this as if you're in, if you're playing soccer or football for my friends outside of the US, if you're on the pitch and you're, the heuristic is like, we're raising a half million dollars at a three and a half million pre and it's like, and it's a big market. I'd be like, kind of sounds about right. What you don't wanna do is you don't wanna be in the stands or out on the street, right? So you're like, we're raising a half million dollars on a 10 million pre with zero revenue. I'd be like, mm, no. And keep in mind that every stage of funding has information asymmetry. So in the earliest stage, when you take friends and family money, I want you to give them the best deal of everybody who invested in your company because they're taking the most risk. But at that stage, you know more about the valuation than they do because they're investing in you. As you get to angels who've done repeat deals, you're gonna get feedback of like, that price seems a little high. And they have more data than you do because they've seen deals they've invested in, deals they passed on or deals they've missed. The same is true as you go up to VCs, right? There's more information asymmetry. So what you're looking for is the heuristic of like, am I kind of on the pitch or not, right? If you're up in the stands, right? So we have this um, angel investor call, early stage VC call that EJ and his team has run forever. And we'll be like, oh yeah, I saw that deal. Um, I thought it was priced too high, right? And you, you may have told me one price and EJ a different price. So just think about it, be consistent. No, we're talking to, and that's super useful for you in your process of, of out pitching investors. All right, other questions? Hey, 
Hey, Dave, this is Brian. I got one one quick question for you. Go for it. Yeah, um, I was curious. You mentioned in, early in the deck, I think, about uh, picking primary and secondary revenue model. So yep. is that mostly around just ensuring you're kind of doing the tracking the key metrics and then evolve that over time? Or, or can you just elaborate a little bit on how yeah. to kind of execute against it? So the, the, the concept there, Brian, is what you're building, I hope is unique, but it may not be but how you make money is like seldom if ever unique. So picking a primary revenue model, let's call it subscription. You're like, I think we're gonna monetize on subscription. And at least having a thesis about how you're gonna monetize matters a lot versus like, we're gonna create a new revenue model. And the answer is mm, maybe. And again, if it's the 15th, I'll totally write about it. Right. But the, the challenge is there is now you have a level of complexity that's just way off the charts. I have to get product market fit for my product and I have to prove out a new revenue model and the answer is, dang, that's like crazy hard versus like, we're just going to sell in subscriptions. Woohoo. Yep. Yep. Right. Or we think we're going to, as we scale, we're going to build tools so we can track metered services. Great. Or, hey, we're going to charge a transaction fee and this is what the market will bear. So just know that. So a couple of quick examples on that. When we first started the data set, do you guys remember Groupon? Crazy Groupon thing. Groupon ultimately became just a commerce company with lead gen. So revenue models by themselves are not defensible. So you, know, you can go all the way back to pay-per-click models with uh, GoToNet becoming uh, Yahoo, becoming a copycat by this new company called Google, who Yahoo sued, and right that whole thing. That was actually a patented revenue model that ultimately wasn't defensible either because pay-per-click as a revenue model wasn't defensible. So Groupon had, remember the thousands of competitors they had? Like It was like, we're just like Groupon, only better and in this city. So ultimately that revenue model peaked and became commerce and lead gen. Then we saw this fictitious one that, that was a flash in a pan. Remember coins and tokens? That one came up and then there was actually, there was no way to actually track the unit economics or conversion rates. Consequently, it's not really a revenue model. It was a funding model and the SEC ultimately said it was not legal, but that's a different issue. So, but it wasn't a revenue model. But then we did see um, metered service launch out of subscription, which is super cool, right? And we also see kind of the decline, the long-term decline of licensing. But of, and again, it's six plus years of, I know I'm super geeky about this stuff, but after six years, the answer is, if you have a new one, I'm super anxious to look at it. <laughs> but uh, focus on your product being unique, less on your revenue model being unique. Just be a copycat there. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks. Yep. Hey, Dave. Yes, sir. Um, I have a unique experience and it's very limited, as you know, because you were, you're helping us through it. But um, having gotten acquired by ServiceNow, they're very focused on team and tech talents and they're not really looking for high revenue companies. And so um, just on that front, I, I put out um, basically just some blogs about my experience when a company is really interested in the team and the tech and not necessarily the revenue. Um, and one thing that I learned, just um, if you're an entrepreneur on this call, is that the bigger tech team that you have does make a difference in the acquisition price because they're thinking about, okay, I'm acquiring technical talent at a certain benchmark of, you know, one to two million dollars per head or whatever you would compare that to with other comparison companies. But do you have any thoughts or comments on that? I was going to just link to the my experience there in the chat, but do you have any comments on like number of technical people that you've seen in other deals where that actually matters for the acquisition price? Yeah, you bet on the continuum, Patrick, you're totally spot on. On the continuum of early revenue, and, and we're seeing a lot of early exits these days, which is really fascinating. Um, lots of observations that could be drawn from that. But the idea there is my cost to acquire a team is equal to my cost of recruiting plus the first year ramp rate plus, you know, does the talent work together? So I can now get to a multiple of people instead of a multiple of revenue. And hopefully in, in like your case, doing a multiple of both um, early revenue and people gets the number up if you create competition. Um, most startups will, um, you're going to have your first look is going to be based on uh, revenue first and the trajectory of your revenue growth, unless it's an early exit. And in that case, it has to be part of a strategic fit for the buyer so yep. like in your case, totally spot on, right? The, the product team looks at it and says, this is a product we need and we can yep. either go build it or we can buy them. Now we're going to value them based on the multiple of people as well as revenue. Yeah. But I think the big fit there for everybody is to recognize is that 
you have to connect with not the corp dev person, you have to connect with the product owner or if they're a smaller company, the CEO, who really looks at it and says like, this product, we need to have this product in our roadmap. And if we yes. do, it's a great acquisition. If, if you talk to the corp dev people and the product isn't in their roadmap, then their answer is like, mm -hmm. I guess now, I'm just going to say that, Dave, that's being on the inside of ServiceNow. I've actually been doing a lot of networking with startups that are looking to get acquired by ServiceNow. And that's one of the first questions is, um, well, let's go, let me get you with the product team and see if that's even on the roadmap. And if it is, and you guys look uniquely interesting, then um, you kind of want to staff up and <laughs> make sure yeah, you're bringing a good sure. size team. So, but yeah, I just have a, I, I linked it there in the chat for you, but awesome. thanks for and, speaking to that. And David, thanks for adding the notes on the Burkas method as well. By the way, I've totally internet stocked Dave Burkas for years and years, like comment on his blog a couple of times. I use this as a marketing hack for you all if you're a startup founder. Um, so I reached out to him and commented on his blog and said, this is really awesome. Thanks for doing this. And then at one point I reached out to him and said, hey, Dave, you don't know me. I've been kind of an internet stalker for years and I just finished this book. Can I send you a copy? And if you like it, would you write a blurb? And he sent me back a note and said, N I not usually I skim these and I write a blurb. He's like, I actually read yours cover to cover and it's super awesome. And it's going to be the handbook for blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait, a total internet stalker paid off, right? In a good way, stalker, not in a bad way, stalker. So. Just know you can do that with thought leaderships in, in thought leaders in your area of your market. And, but do something, reach out to them and comment on their stuff first. Um, my, my quick observation is I have three to 5,000 readers a month on my blog. I will get on average three comments. If you comment on my blog more than two times, I clearly know who you are, right? So, and then when you need something, I'm like, I, you're like, a, you're a super fan. I would totally do something for you. What are you talking about? All right, uh, George asked the question, Impact early state valuation, does early adopter discount contracts bring in the early adopters? We're getting the example 74. So th this is a pricing question and we do a pricing seminar for WTIA. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar, if you're a founder and you're not familiar with WTIA uh, startup programs, yet yeah, look at, um, I, I chair the board there for startup programs. So we do a, a pricing seminar. So think about this pricing question that, that George is asking. What do, what do I do with discounted contracts of like POCs and proof of concepts early on? The answer is set a market accept a price of what you think you're going to charge and then give the discount for the early adopter price, but set the expectation for the customer that the price is going to go back up to the market rate at a later date. The big question there becomes, you can always discount, but it's hard to raise prices once you've discounted them publicly but we do a whole seminar on pricing and how to test pricing and how to A-B testing and, and all that as well. But yeah, pricing has a big driver in your valuation ultimately. It's one of your inputs on, on delivering value, right? Revenue models and input, marketing costs, sales costs, and you know customer success costs are all part of that cost. Um, investors will view that discounting. If you're er early on, they recognize you're getting POCs, but you just need to show me a path that I can go from a $29 a month customer to a $250 a month customer, if that's really your, your question. Um, great. Other questions? We got, oh, we're at the top of the hour. Ejen, it's back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for participating and having such a great engaging conversation. And thanks very much to Dave, you know, for sharing all his insights and analysis with us today. So as Dave mentioned, we'll be sending out the slides afterwards. And uh, if you are interested in this book, please uh, feel free to go to the link. Um, do you send it out, Dave, the link to your... I'll, I'll put it in the chat window right now. Yep. So I'm a lousy self-promoter. I got to get better that my publisher says. I see some folks have already bought it in real time while you were speaking. So um, yeah. anyways, uh, they do send it out and uh, leave, a, leave a five star review, of course, for, for, for Dave. So we support our, our local community leaders. And, uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, have a fantastic rest of the week. Thank you to Enjoy all. Enjoy the weather, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye.